Hello everyone and welcome to another Metal Game episode with Coach B and MasterChess.com. In this video we're going to take a look at a couple of positions with bishops of opposite colors. I will go more in depth into these type of end games later on. However, I wanted to go over these type of positions a little bit just because most of the time in the middle game is when most trades happen that might lead you in a bishop of opposite color type of game. Understanding how the outcome might turn out is crucial. Now, we know from theory that most of the bishop of opposite color games end up in a draw. And simply for the reason that the bishops can't touch, they can't defend what the other attacks or attack what the other defends. And if you place your king and pawns on the opposite color of the enemy bishop, that bishop will not be able to touch you at all. So here is one such example where white is up two pawns However, he's not going to be able to get a win here just because black secured the position. All his pawns and king are on the opposite color of the opponent's bishop. Here, first of all, the white king has no place going towards the pawn on a4 because there's no way to attack it. The pawn on a4 attacks the square b3, which would be the only square that he would be able to touch the pawn. Now, obviously, if he tries to go around, he's going to try to uh, fight for the b5 pawn to be able to take the a4 pawn. But if he tries to do that, for example, something like king to d8, black here can simply move the bishop to g4, and together with the king, they are fighting for the square c7 and c8, creating a wall, and white cannot get to the pawn on b5. So after something like bishop to f6, the bishop could just stay on that diagonal, for example, bishop f5, bishop g7, bishop g4. If the king comes back to e7, let's say bishop to h5, even here if white attacks the pawn on f6, and now obviously if black moves the bishop away, white will be able to take that pawn and get a win, but he doesn't need to. The black king can simply move to d7 and securing the position. There's absolutely nothing that white can do here to get a win. Another reason that this position is a dead draw and very important to realize is that black's weaknesses, the pawn on g6 and the pawn on b5, are really far away. This next position is very similar to the previous position we've seen. White is up two pawns and black's king and pawns are on the opposite color of the opponent's bishop. However, the big difference is that his targets are a lot closer together. The weakness on b5 and e6 are again just two files apart. If white can win the e6 pawn, win the c6 square, or turn the pawn on e5 into a passer, then the game will be his. If black can stop white from doing those things, the game will be drawn. In this case, the two areas of combat will be the e6 and the c6 square, which are just a step away from each other. So white will win this game. I also want to mention that if the bishop would be on the a2 to d5 diagonal, then this game would be drawn. Anywhere on these squares, if the bishop would be there already, then this game would be a draw. Coming back from the beginning, any other tries that black has will not successfully work. For example, if he's trying to prevent the pawn on d5 moving forward with something like bishop to e4, well, this immediately loses to king takes on e6, and now white has two pass pawns that he can march with. Coming back, a better try would be bishop to g8. But after this, here white simply is going to push the pawn to d5, check. If e takes d5 here, then we move e6. And now anything that the bishop can try, it's not going to work. For example, if he goes with bishop to h7, after king to f6, there's nothing that black can do here to prevent it. The king is pretty much trapped, cannot move anywhere except the square b7. And then if he moves the bishop to g8, after e7, the bishop will have to sacrifice, and then we will promote the pawn and win. And after e6, if d4, after king f6, let's say bishop to h7, e7, the bishop will have to sacrifice again coming to g6. After we take the bishop, the king comes next to the pawn, we're just gonna protect it and promote the other pawn. And coming back, after we move the pawn to d4 and king to f6, if the king moves to d5, for example, well here we're simply gonna march the pawn and same story, we will be able to win the bishop and, and win the game from here. 
So here, if black moves the bishop to f5, protecting the pawn on e6, from here, white will respond with d5, check. And no matter which way black takes here, it's going to end up in a loss. If he does, king takes d5. Then after king to d7, white now has access to the square c6. After black bishop to g4 and c6, this game is winning for white. There's nothing that black can do to prevent that pawn from promoting. And coming back after d5, if black takes with the pawn here, e takes d5. Then after e6, white blocks the path of the bishop. d4, king f6, attacking the bishop. d3, bishop to f4, preventing that pawn from moving. Bishop to g4, king to f7. Bishop h5, king to f8. After bishop to g6, e7. King to d7 attacking the promoting square twice so that pawn is frozen temporarily however after c6 check the king will have to move away so after this king takes c6 white will promote and after that win his bishop and now from here the game is totally winning king to d5 king d7 king d4 king c6 king c3 king takes on b5 king b3 bishop to g5 king c2 white takes the other pawn and even though black wins white's bishop with two pawns this position is totally winning this next position you could see that white is up two pawns however black's weaknesses are really far away here with the correct play this game will end up in a draw after king to f8 let's say f5 king to e7 king to d5 preparing to push on e6 bishop to c3 bishop to e2 after black moves pawn to f6 and e6, bishop to d2, this is a dead draw. There's nothing that white can do to attack black's weaknesses on g7 or a5. The black bishop will keep an eye on a5 and also these other pawns will not be able to penetrate. Even if he tries marching the g and h pawn and then tries something like, like king to c4, bishop to b4, king to b5, bishop to c3. Let's say g5 trying a breakthrough. Well, h just takes on g5. h takes g5. f takes g5. Some king c4, bishop to b4. There's nothing that white can do here. Now, coming back from the beginning, let's add two rooks into the game, and you will see how this game changes dramatically. So now this is the exact same position we had before. However, both sides now have a rook, and this changes the game completely. What really makes black's life a living hell now is the combination of white's rook and the bishop hitting on f7. This completely immobilizes black's army and leaves him waiting helplessly while white improves his position. The heat against f7 combined with the extra kingside pawn ensures an easy victory for white. After something like pawn to g6, g4, let's say bishop c3, f5, g takes f5, g takes f5, bishop to b4, f6, bishop to c3, king f5, bishop to b4. Black wants to stay on this diagonal. If he makes the mistake, for example, moving the bishop to b2, well here, white can push the other pawn, b4, after a takes b4 and a5, black's b pawn isn't going anywhere, thanks to the light square bishop while white's a pawn will confidently march down the board and either promote or win the bishop. So coming back after bishop to b4, e6, f takes e6, bishop takes e6, check, king to h8, king to g6. Now checkmate on h7 is threatened. The only way black can prevent this is sacrificing his rook. So after rook takes f6 and king takes f6, white again is easily winning being up a rook. So you could see coming back from the beginning that it would have been a terrible mistake for white to trade his rooks because that game would end up in a draw. While keeping the rooks and putting pressure together with the other pieces secured a victory. This next position is taken from a game played by two masters, Repensev and Guo, played in 2007. And this position was reached after 28 moves. It's clear that bishops of opposite colors can be a real problem for the superior side. If you have an extra pawn or two and feel that the opposite colored bishop might make the winning process a nightmare, then go out of your way to exchange one of the bishops. 
This sounds obvious, but I've seen many players not grab the chance for such a trade and pay for it later when a lost half point. So in this position, white has a solid extra pawn and the superior king, which would love to rush into the enemy position via king to d3 to c4 to b5 and to a6. However, the d4 pawn is under pressure and a possible knight c7 will keep white's king out of b5. Even more bothersome is the presence of bishops of opposite colors. So, without any hesitance, white snapped off the knight on e6, ending that bishop opposite color threat. So after bishop takes e6, f takes e6, knight to f4, which threatens knight to g6 check, also ties the enemy king to the defense of e6. The game continued with bishop to g7, a4, e5, d takes e5, d takes e5. Coming back, if black takes the pawn with the bishop, after knight to g6, white will take the bishop and go into a winning pawn endgame. Coming back in the game, d takes e5 was played. After knight to d5, king to d6 and king to c4, black resigned. Getting rid of the opposite color bishop made the whole winning process smooth and worry-free. So as we've seen in this video, bishop of opposite colors do increase the defender's chances of holding an inferior endgame in many cases. However, if more pieces are on the board, that will definitely favor the attacker in the game. If you liked my video, please subscribe and don't forget to check out my new website, MasterYourChess.com, where you can learn, practice, test and master your chess knowledge.